and you'll understand later why I said that. It's uh, 20 to 12, and let's start once again. Let's start again with a new guest, with a new participant to talk about Syria, to talk about Iraq. Our next speaker comes from Iraq, from Kirkuk. He's Monsignor Joseph Thomas Milkis, Archbishop of Kirkuk and Assistant Archbishop of the Patriarch of Babylonia, of the Chaldea. Monsignor Kirkuk is a theologist of uh, theology. He's a doctor in theology. He's also the founder of the Human Sciences uh, School in Baghdad. He is a member of the Union of Iraqi Journalists, the Union of Journalists in the Third Countries, and of the Union of Catholic International Journalists. Monsignor, we are colleagues. You are, you know, you've always been a journalist, right? Bonjour. Good morning. I think they've given me the most difficult question, which is the persecution of Christians in Syria and Iraq. I believe that this is a very difficult question that have been posed because since the second century the, we have been trying to respond to why the Christians are being executed. We have seen the film of Asia Bibi and nowadays everybody has spoken one way or the other about this persecution. And I must say, too, that Jesus said, you will be persecuted like he was uh, because of your religion. And those that will persecute you will, uh, well, you will see you as a sacrifice to God. But the persecuted, why are they persecuted? Because they are not Christians. We were born Christians. We have no merit on that. We are Christians by birth, but that doesn't make us Christian. What happens today in our region is a persecution. It's a political persecution because Christians are different. The way of eating, of drinking, of dressing, of being free. And this different way of doing things upsets fanatics. Our patriarch, his petitude, has just published an interview book published two months ago. Uh, he was interviewed by a journalist called Laurence de Jumont. Sorry, Laurence de Joyaux, he was called. And he asked him t- this question. And he answered that the Christians are persecuted because their wives do not wear a veil, because they drink alcohol because they are different and all all the fanatics of the world don't accept differences of different people. The risk of being persecuted socially or politically uh, is suffered by us and Christians normally uh, take the word of Jesus to the letter, we could say. So when we say, be cautious like the snake, you know that when we make a noise, the pigeons leave. 
So many Christians have escaped Iraq, Syria. They have fled from the Middle East, and the statistics are clear on that. And explain to us that maybe in a few years there will not be Christians left in that region. And this is a topic that was mentioned here yesterday and today. This is a um, serious problem, but the Christians are persecuted need to bear, bear in mind that being cautious like a snake, and the snakes are cautious, they're wise, they do not flee, they keep a low profile, they hide, and then they also try to defend themselves, of course. And it's a bit, today in, within our communities, our Christian communities, there is a battle Should we flee or should we stay? That is the superficial question. To flee? Well, I've visited all our Christian diasporas from Iraq who have disseminated across the globe. And I think we are one of the most Um, disseminated or extended uh, families of the world, but not just in one place, but in different continents. I have one so one sister in each continent: Australia, Europe, Africa, America, and Asia. So this uh, scattering, this spread, has meant that Christians have gone and decided to stay in those countries, but it's not clear, it's not easy to do that. And so this sociological and political persecution has benefited those people one way or the other. And that's why when I go to conferences or when I heard yesterday that we have to uh, study this a bit, there are very few studies about the diaspora. They are about the Palestinian diasporas and others, but there are very few about ours. And they are, these societies are a bit unstable societies always. So what we was left is to try as hard as we can to keep the Christian presence in Iraq. This is also problematic because just to stay does not mean anything. Simply staying doesn't do anything. We have to be witnesses. We have to evangelize. And the word to evangelize in Arabic, it's nearly a taboo. The word has been used against us as the reason for a direct persecution. You do evangelization. You evangelize. That's a criticism for them. And... I've been working in Iraq for 30 years now as a teacher of theology, as a publisher, as a journalist, and as a publisher of national catechism of magazines for children and for adults. And I have tried during those 30 years to try and correct a little bit the word evangelization because he wants to say, to give the good news, to spread the good news. When we have lunch in a nice restaurant, well, you spread the word. You tell your friends. You say that restaurant was good. It's not propaganda. It's not a proxenetism. It's talking about something that I was happy with. So if I'm a Christian and Jesus uh, gives me pleasure, then... It's bad if I cannot spread the word. So I need to be able to tell people what I found, that I found Jesus and that it's very good and that what I saw was really nice. And so I would like to spread, I would like to communicate what I feel. I like to tell the community around me without being ashamed of it. People, Christians should be able to go to their villages and say, look, I would like to share with you what I found. Look at this. I found him, and he says, 
He spreads the word, and not because of words, but because we have seen it. Evangelization has two stages. The first one is about talking to anyone, and the second person of meeting specific people. So during these 30 years, I have tried to spread the word. And I'm going to focus on one way of doing it. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my work with the Bible, just with the Bible, because I would like to announce today that uh, one month ago I left for the first time in history. That I've, uh, we've published the first Kurdish Bible, the first uh, Kurdish Bible, and in the translation I say, I offered my brothers what we have, which is the most precious thing that we have, which is the word of God, the gospel. And I include a CD. And so for those who are illiterate, they will be able to have contact with the word of God. It's not proselytism. It's evangelization. I give you a book, but you're free to read it or not in your language, you are able to discover what Jesus, what was written. That was before, but now we want to work uh, also importing Bibles thanks to the society in Lebanon and Jordan. And thanks to that uh, group, they have enabled me to be able to publish two Bibles in Arabic, in fact, one of them in Arabic. And with this work of distribution of Bibles in Iraq, I would like to tell you that we are distributing them. And we were still under the regime of Saddam Hussein. The regime was, uh, well, prohibited the entry of any Bible. The Bible was a forbidden book since 1613 till, since 63 till, or rather, since 73 till in the mid 80s, the Bible was forbidden. The regime forbid the crossing of the borders of the Bible. It was forbidden to enter, to bring Bibles into Iraq. So I was like a snake. And like a snake, I started going in and out of offices to try and somehow lift that interdiction and. The first time I managed to get 1,000 copies. After that, 3,000. After that, 10,000. At the end, I had 1.5 million Bibles were distributed in Iraq. So, of course, that was against the law is against uh, fanatism fanaticism too because fanaticism always tries to it's always hidden it's always concealed under the table because in our society what's said on the media what's said openly is totally different to what's said over the table really and um, that is the main thing of our problem that is the biggest problem that we have is that we do not know where persecution comes from because uh, under the regime, the old regime and the current regime, we do not know who's who. We don't know. And that's why with the, the under the dictatorship, we had fear. Now, with this new regime of non-government that we currently have, we are we live in a, with anxiety, not knowing who's our friend, who's our enemy, and in fact, that has led to the disparition, uh, disappearance of uh, the authority of any security forces in our society. I would also like to say that we should not have the fear of those who kill, but of those who could bring our souls and our bodies to hell. Because when we say that Christians are persecuted, persecuted why? From a sociological point of view, that's not merit. 
happened when they came into the cathedral Notre Dame de la Deliverance in Baghdad. They took people out of the church and they killed them, children, women. Those poor people, they are not martyrs. They did not give up their heart to be killed, if you know what I mean. They are not martyrs, not like in the times of the Romans. So there are people that are victims of a brick project and they find by chance they find themselves that in their situation in that, that place and they're killed there's a bit of a mixture of a blending of everything now and that word everyone's called martyr but not everyone is a martyr in fact christians christians are called to take on the reins of their lives and to do it and not to be removed. And that means that, well, as we heard this morning, what we heard about the violence and non-violence, whether we should defend ourselves or not, we are not, we do not always have the possibility of being at the right time on the right place and to have the good reflexes to respond as we should. We are a minority. We are in a minority, a weak, vulnerable minority, and we can also be victims like all other minorities. And that's why I do not talk only about the persecution of Christians by non-Christians, but about others, that other people that also have minorities and that suffer more than us even. I know that Christians have not... I, have not denied uh, their, their, their choice. I mean, I know that, but many times Christians have preferred to leave everything, their homes, their money, their village, but at least they have kept their faith. And we should be proud of that. We should really be proud of that. That is true. We are proud of our faith. But those Christians that have that are persecuted because not only they are on the defensive but they also attack they attack fanaticism they attack they talk about it and they try to um, expand this in the society and they try to be the good Christians that they asked to be that community as a mean to survive We cannot do it on our own, and that's why I thank you for having invited us all to talk to you. Uh, You have enabled us to be in contact with your society, because these societies uh, here also have their uh, difficult times. They also have their difficulties or obstacles. You have to defend your country against the Muslim invasion since the um, 7th century. So... Christians, these are Christians born in our country, and they are Christian because they were born like it. And we want to be destroyed. They want to they want to destroy us. Muslims some Muslims want to destroy us. And I know hundreds and thousands of Muslims who are being kidnapped by these uh, fanatists, by these people that do have kidnapped, we could say their religion, but that they do not have weapons against it. So I must say sometimes that we need to get to know that society through many times I have said that illiteracy that has invaded this country is the same as uh, fanaticism, for instance, in Egypt. We have heard about the Egyptians. Egypt, eight years ago, was more literate, more open than now as a country. And the increase of fanaticism goes head to head with illiteracy. There's a report by the UN published in 2003 that is very clear about it, about the emptiness, the intellectual and cultural emptiness that has invaded the Muslim world and the Islamic world and how people have taken refuge in fanaticism. 
And this is not something that comes from yesterday or that happened yesterday or a month ago, two months ago. It happened before that. Centuries, there's been centuries of this. And we need to analyze the situation with through different disciplines in order to understand that what happening today in our region, in our world, in our Arab and Muslim world is really the fruit or the consequence of many centuries of a refusal to advance. The Arab culture has helped West, the West a lot through the uh, philosophers, doctors, uh, thinkers, etc. And uh, we, Dominicans, we have to remember that uh, there were people persecuted by uh, extremists from France at the time. I remember in the, 12th, in the 13th century, I remember how that happened. We know the story. And... Um, Thomas of a Queen, for instance, is an example of that. And we know how we we need to see how we can help our society, how we can go beyond that. It's not something about just black or white, Muslim, Christian, or Christians and non-Christians. We are all the same. There are some differences between us, normal. But Muslims are always different, different between them. And that's why I believe that there are German, the, the Catholic Church uh, said 50 years ago, currently we're praying, we're wishing for the Muslim society, for the Muslim religion to try and do this. And I can tell you that we have started doing that thanks to the media, thanks to the internet, thanks to all of this, thanks to other media. Everything that puts in front of us, uh, you know, they bring the news to our homes and they bring new ideas to our homes, ideas that we found difficult to propose in the past, we can propose now thanks to the media. And that's why I think there is a lot of work that needs to be done in order to promote these small pieces, these small areas that can be found, everyone that try to improve that society. They will heal their own society. They will stand up. They will wake up, rather, from this uh, nightmare, from this cancer that has invaded our societies. On the other hand, and I am, I've been 15 months, um, I've had to face also the learning of my profession as a pastor, as a minister, and to try and see how also from August onwards, how we can face things that are much more from the earth than I thought before. In 2014, July, the Christians of Mosul were court, there was 2,000 people. The night from the 6th of, to the 7th of August, 2014, the whole valley, the whole place of Ninev, plains of Ninive, uh, we saw how the Christians and other minorities were taken hostage. 150,000 Christians had to take refuge. Uh, when I was in Kirkuk, I received We received some of the refugees, even though most of them went to the diocese of Mr. Warda and to two other dioceses. And therefore, we have tried to establish a system to be able to take on these people to give them shelter. We had to solve uh, many logistical problems. We had to find as many people as lived in my diocese because the same amount of people came to take refuge. So and they needed uh, food, they needed housing, they needed uh, clothes, and they needed help so that they could overcome the trauma. It was uh, necessary to be able to reflect and find 
many different ways to face the situation, a situation for which we were not ready. I'm going to tell you a story to show you how a society can face such a trauma. In one of our neighborhoods, there was a home with a three-bedroom home, uh, three bedrooms and one uh, living room. And was the, the man had the kids and grandchildren with him, and he took on refugees, a total of Well, a total of 71 people that slept in that home everywhere, as you can imagine. There were children, youngsters, this house was small, and the poor dad had a small problem, and he suffered a small heart attack, and he went to the hospital, and the children went to see him at the hospital, and they said, Dad, The children are crying, all that noise. I think that's what tied you out. Do you want us to ask them to leave, to find shelter somewhere else? And the man said this sentence. He said, no, no, not at all. And what can you do with hospitality? We we can't do that. We have no right to do that, even if we cannot, we have, do not have the right to throw them out. And this, can, this example is, can be multiplied by hundreds. People that have given everything, that have uh, taken in people, offered their homes, tried to help them. And this is truly the Christian spirit. This is a testimony that I offer you. I'm uh, very proud. I think that Christianity has a very good theological aspects, but in practice, this hospitality is that. It's exactly that. It's everything. It's what matters. Of the, the statement of the um, truth of reincarnation, uh, he came to our home and he was recognized. That's our testimony. That's what we have to do, you and us. And when we do that, then we all become equal. There are no differences. You may be calmer than us, but in terms of hospitality, we all have certain demands. We want to give on the face of God. And in my diocese, which is between Kurdistan and central, central Iraq, we are a region that speaks Arabic, and everyone that takes refuge speaks Arabic. And they have... They are, ac- they are accepted in the universities and uh, teaching establishments of Kurdistan. They came to my families, also st- uh, to my home and to my diocese, also students. We had to show them how we lived and we had to help them continue their studies. We have recovered, we have managed to uh, make up for that uh, delay and now 150 university students were able to uh, recover the time lost. So those studying medicine, pharmaceutics, etc. They've all pharmacy rather they've all come to take refuge in our diocese and we have tried to f- see how we can help them to overcome this situation. You can imagine the um, changes the how destabilizing that is, how that has affected our society, our morale. And I can tell you that I have more problems with my Christians than with the non-Christians, of course. We are scared. 13 kilometers from Kirkuk is where we are. We never know when we're going to be invaded. The fear is also part of our struggle. We need to fight against despair, against fear either because you're born Christian or because uh, from a social point of view you think you need to flee in order to save yourself, save your children. And the others, what about the others? What will we do for them? I'll make you laugh. Ninive is famous because of the book of Jonas. The book of Jonas was the first Islamic state because he was very happy that God 
said, I'm going to destroy Nineveh, for a Jew to destroy Nineveh was something extraordinary, it was the an, an extraordinary occasion. That's why they tried to beat God and they escaped to Spain. And they fled from Jerusalem, and he, well, he fled from Jerusalem and came to Spain. But instead of going in the other direction towards Nidibe, uh, God wanted to teach him a lesson, because this was uh, written during the third century before Christ, and in the sixth century, Nin- Nidibe was the persecutor, the cursed city that had caused the first exile and that had destroyed the king of Israel. So destroying the city was what Jonas wanted and God wanted to do the opposite. Nineveh will become that, uh, will become true and Jonah will receive, will learn the lesson. I must. I cannot destroy Nineveh because there are 12,000 children. We have forgotten about the animals. And that was the first environmental mention made in the Old Testament. Jonas, Jonah, Jonah was transformed. He was... Um, Crazy, and he and Christians are the ones that need to move things forward. It's very difficult for us not to make, not to see as evil the others. We have spent so much time dividing the world into good and bad, into those who are good and those who are bad. No, that's not what we need to do. Everywhere we find good and evil. And being a Christian, does not mean that you are on the good side. That's what uh, extremists say. That's what they do and what they say. The Daesh want an Islamic state, a pure Islamic state, a Sunni state. But in fact, the victims are not Christians only, or the Yazidis. They are the Sunnis that are the victims too. We have more Sunni refugees than uh, refugees from any other origin, over four million. The governor of Kirkuk told me that in Kirkuk, we have 400,000 people as refugees for an area that only has 1.4 million. There's no space. There are not enough infrastructures to accept them, to take them in, and that is our situation. If we only look to ourselves, if we only look at, if we only focus on Christians and if we don't see beyond that, we won't see anybody else. And we have to think about all the other people, the elderly, the sick, the children. We have a small uh, dispensary in our Uh, church and all of those who work there most of them are Muslims they're not Christians I said that um, the Muslims doctors that come to render their services are many I've only got uh, five Christian doctors and these people that want to help that want to um, alleviate pain. I have medicine that comes from everywhere, friends that come from everywhere to offer services, many services. Not only there is a lack of food, there's also a group of theater, theater club, that performs for the children so that they can overcome the trauma. They do carnival for children. They try to teach them songs to have hope. There is a song that said, I love, and I love even when I am sad, because I have hope in you. And repeating words such as this, when, you know, we put on the face of the earth, the do- you know, we put there the, the do- musicians, actors, etc. even clowns, 
that can make life easier for children. So we visit the refugee camps and we give them hope. N'ayez pas peur, mais... Don't be afraid but to have fear. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of people that kill your body, but do be afraid of those who can uh, cast shadows on your soul, as Jesus said. I think that this warning affects us all. Here in the West, the Western Christians can help us. I believe that they can help us as Christians themselves, remembering their values. The current problem in the West is the division between society and religion. Perhaps this is a result of the past and has problematic consequences. And I think that right now Christians are different to the Christians of four or five centuries ago in, at the time of the Inquisition, because in Spain, Spain is famous for the Inquisition, and the Dominicans, mea culpa. So, today with, an, with extraordinary popes such as Jean Paul II, Benedict XVI or Francis, we are invited to listen to them more closely and to try to re revive the, fl the flame of faith. It needs reviving. Perhaps our suffering can help to revive their faith. And perhaps Christians who wish to come here, Maybe they will feel disappointed. Many people who have emigrated to Europe and America, when I talk to them, they tell me that they had a different idea of Western countries. And they say that they feel disappointed because the community spirit does not exist. It's individualism which predominates and is most important. The hospitality of communities, immigrant communities in Europe, is a very difficult and important issue. Many thinkers currently affirm that Europe has not known or has not been able to integrate immigrants, and what happens here is difficult. If we, on the 7th of August, there were 23 interviews during one single day, and I said in, in France, in Holland, in Germany, in England, and I, uh, following the events, and I told the, the people that what had happened in our country was like what the Nazis did. It was an Anschluss. Uh, people in France said, oh, it's Germany. They're going to invade part of Europe. But uh, it's, we have to prepare. It's the start of the Third World War. I know that Europeans only feel fear when they really see themselves affected. And what I said was, uh, well, in the end it came true with Charlie Hebdo with the trains in Spain, everything that happens with your minorities. This thinking is something we are familiar with because we live with this. This is, well, we are talking about thousands of people and the average age is 20, 25. There is nobody there with gray hair. They are all young fanatics. They are enlightened. They're sick. But uh, they really do have the desire to defeat. And this is even more dangerous than having weapons. 
they sacrifice their lives like kamikazes. And many, well, just what can we do when we're facing fanatics and behind them there exists a political problem because of the prime minister, the Shiites, the Sunnites. We find ourselves in an ideological um, craziness and this comes from a, a vacuum and it's a result of this uh, delirium. This delirium began in 1989 And these ideas are the kind of communicating vas vessels. They go from the communist world and they've moved into our societies. The European wars, the war of Spain, the European wars, they have come to us because it is exactly the same logic which is behind them. So what do we need to do? Where can we run away to? If everybody wants to escape, who's going to cure society? Who is going to try to say something different to what we are hearing in the media? This nationalist fanaticism or religious fanaticism, it's the same thing. We have gone from the fanaticism of the Arab nation through to the, the Muslim fanaticism. And in reality is a war between communities, communities which come into conflict, people who take advantage of fear in order to try to invent enemies. And the United States have come along to blow our region with mass weapons, but fanaticism and Al-Qaeda is not what they're fighting in reality. And They have failed. They have come, dropped bombs, and gone. And now all of the demons have appeared from the very bottom of our misery. And right now, the world should reflect with us and help us to control and hunt down our demons. The gospel is full of Uh, de devils and demons and the possessed. We need a new spirituality. We need a new culture. If you know how to help us, help us reflect upon this and let us all uh, prevent fragmentation because in our churches there is a lot of fragmentation. There are many useless discussions and debates and the condemnation of others. But I think it is necessary to set the right objective to work together, to move towards perhaps a new era, as Jesus said, on the day or the night before of his, the night before his death, 24 hours before his death, he spoke to his disciples. He gave his testament, the New Testament, love each other. So let's Let all Christians love each other. Thank you very much for everything. Muchas gracias, Monseñor. Thank you very much, Monseñor. You have given us such a huge number of wonderful subjects to talk about. Uh, I've got loads of notes on my bits of paper in front of me that I wrote down as I was listening. I don't know where to start. One first thing, you've talked about the, the fruits of martyrdom. I'd like to share an impression of mine uh, as a result of what we've been listening to and messages we've been receiving over the last two days. I have the impression that one of the fruits of martyrdom, uh, of what's happening in countries such as yours, these f the fruits are, uh, are being seen here and now. People saying, listen, I'm being converted. These were Christian or Catholic people before they came here. And listening to you, a friend has said to me, or a colleague has said to me, I'm going to convert. 
the fruits of the martyrdom of your countries is having results here and in many countries right now. I would thank you for this, and I would like to thank all of the people in your country. If we talk about Muslim communities, I, uh, they, well, we can see that they are trying to develop a, a Vatican Council. They're trying to overcome their problems. The jihadist fundamentalist movement is not a result of the way Muslim society is progressing? Is that not leading to greater violence in Muslim society? Perhaps they are afraid of the changes that are taking place in Muslim society. Are the jihadists afraid at what they see? Yes, I think that all of the societies have a balance between violence and other ways of progressing. In India, they had Gandhi. In South Africa, they had Nelson Mandela. A dreamer such as Martin, Martin Luther King in the United States. And it's really exciting to see how societies produce their own antidote. I have prayed over recent years for the Muslim world, the Arab world, for it to have its own non-violent leader. I don't know why, but there are people, not such strong people as the ones we saw in South Africa or in India, people who have suffered great uh, personal dramas. Uh, they have paid with their lives. Gandhi and Martin Luther King uh, paid with their lives and Nelson Mandela was in prison for 29 years. I think that, as was said this morning, this is a sign of uh, Jesus the Savior. It's not just political or sociological leadership. There's something different there which man needs. This fragmentation of society, the withdrawal of society, makes it more difficult and the people are suspicious of each other and we have these lessons that we have observed in Iraq or Syria on the path to reconciliation towards a great extraordinary Middle East, just like the EU after all of those terrible wars or the, the developments in Yugoslavia with those small countries. And this is a lesson. We do not know how to do this because we do not have, we do not have leadership. We do not have enough thinkers who are able to convince us, to persuade us. All ideologies, ideologies um, that have finished the 20th century. We do not want to see them repeated. Unfortunately, we copy each other. And everything that happens in our country, as I know history, we see that the same things, the same dramas reappear over and over again. We could read Arab novels or novels from East Europe, and we would find the same stories. We could look at legends and mythology and we see that each generation brings with it the same mythology, the same ideas. It's a repetition. And uh, Europe has been cured by its thinkers, philosophers, theologi theologians. In Baghdad, there was an attempt eight years ago to create an academy for human sciences to take an interest or to uh, um, increase interest amongst the elite in the human being. 
And the objective or the, the aim of religion is to serve human beings. And this is our great tragedy because the victims are human beings. It's extraordinary when we hear that there have been 100 deaths. And we feel uh, traumatized, but it immunizes us against the 300 who were killed the next day, or 1,700 students who were killed in Tigrit at an academy. 1,700 were killed in one single day. I have the impression that people uh, reach a point when they no longer can feel the wound. They are like zombies. They do not feel affected by the seriousness of what happens. One or a thousand is the same. It's a human being. With the contribution of human sciences, psychology, great psychologists, how can we contribute with this? I have tried to found, or we tried to found this academy. We have 150 students who strive to feed their thoughts and this these human sciences can overcome religious differences if we talk about psychology and sociology if you do if you look at that there are no longer protestants catholics uh, sunni or Shiite. we are just humans and this can help us in perhaps in an academic way to help our society in this sphere, this would no doubt be something positive. With uh, well, you, you live just 30 kilometers away from the Islamic State. How would you describe life in a place where the Islamic State is just 13 kilometers away from your door? Yes, I try not to think about that. I try not to think too much about that. I refer very often to Cervantes, one of our readers. I have visited the prison in which he wrote the most beautiful, the greatest book, uh, Don Quixote, 400 years ago. Uh, and I ask why the very best things appear in prison. We could talk about St. Francis of Assis because after two years of prison, Cervantes also spent two years in prison. And in the castle in Kirkuk, I spent time there. And if there is a car bomb, I may get blown up when I travel, so when I come and I go, and people feel fear. But this fear must be controlled. And because I have the impression that my testimony of joy and hope will achieve something for my flock and for others because even those who are not in my flock they have children they have elderly people they have beloved families and living 13 kilometers away from the Islamic State is in a way good for me because it stops me from dreaming like the apostles on the mountain and saying oh this is lovely we can just settle here You have mentioned one particularly conflictive uh, issue for European societies, above all Spanish society. It's something quite terrible. Immigration, if we remember what we heard about Nigeria, the girls arrested, sorry, the girls detained by Boko Haram have not been able to come here because the European Union and our own Spanish government Uh, well, um, hinders the arrival of people uh, such as them from entering the European Union. Almost always, Europe and Spain 
uses the excuse of terrorism to build barriers, which I think, in my view, are quite xenophobic. Please, could you further uh, develop that idea of our responsibility regarding immigration? Yes. You have talked about the barriers. Barriers exist in all places, even within families. It is easier to build a barrier than to build a bridge. I have studied bridges when I was in Nantes and in Paris. I presented my, a thesis on bridges, and I discovered that in reality, well, it's, it's a nice story that I'm going to tell you. There were two brothers. Their father had died, and they were arguing, constantly arguing. There was a stream which separated the, their two houses, and they had argued so much that The younger brother asked a builder to build a wall in order to not see the house of his brother. So he went away on a trip, and when he came back, instead of building a wall to separate the two houses, he had built a bridge. And when the other brother came along and saw the bridge, he thought it was the brother who had asked for the bridge to be built, and he gave him a hug, and the other one said, Oh, it's okay. Okay, then. And they were reconciled. And they asked the the builder to stay and live with them. And he said no. He had to build other bridges in other places. We can build bridges instead of building barriers because Europe is like a fortress, a closed fortress. And in 2014, there were 3,000 young people who were saved near Lampedusa when they were trying to cross the Mediterranean. I think it is very sad that many people who lose their lives in this journey could have done many things. They, they try to reach... England and other countries, because when they see reports about young people and how they live, I ask myself if whether those efforts were applied in, in the heart of our societies to create a true community, uh, perhaps the people who die in Iraq after 35 years of dictatorship, the civil society has been practically eliminated. There is no civil solidarity. And we think that the government can do everything. That's the idea. The government does everything and decides everything. And so we have become amorphous societies. We do not have any kind of social initiative. And this is the result of a regime which initiates all action. And after the fall of the regime, we have problems now to find a way out of this psychosis, this way of expecting everything to come from the government. And this dependence, this political dependence or religious dependence and is also a social dependence. And what I'm interested in, if anybody comes to our country and people have come to visit us in our houses, our houses are very clean on the inside, the streets are very dirty. And this shows that in our society, the streets don't matter to us, society doesn't matter to us. And I say this to Catholics, mea culpa, uh, for Catholics around the world in their civil and political life. It's very weak. I've written an article about the 70 million Christians in the United States who have or are very important. Sorry, they are not very important because they are important because they have their feet on the ground. We have 400 thousand Christians still living in Iraq right now, and we have eight political parties, but they don't 
collaborate or try to understand each other. And the church is not very believable, so all help comes via the church. I have not become a bishop but with the idea of distributing money. That would give me a very poor reputation if the money was challenged, channeled through me. Civil society is the one that should take care of this, and I must devote myself to Jesus. I am not here to manage. I'm not a manager, not like Judas, because Judas had the key to the, the, key to the box. A couple of days ago, when I arrived at the offices of Ath Deoir, I was very interested in this symbol. The symbol for this campaign in the more El uh, Mas Libres and Ath Deoir, and the badges and the bracelets, which no doubt you have seen and are based on that logo that we can see. And I want. I said I wanted to take a few. Uh, a few, I, and you asked for some uh, to take away to your for your children to give them, and we would like to see some photos of that. So you're going to go back to Iraq. You're going to give out crosses to your children. Is that wise? Yes. Yes. I have not understood. The bracelets that you took when you came to our offices, the, the badges that you took, you said that you were going to give them to students and children who were doing the catechesis. These Christian religious symbols, can you wear them around Kirkuk? Is it wise for young people to, sh- to wear them visibly? Yes, I would do that. They will be very happy because people are not ashamed uh, to wear religious symbols. That depends of the age, for example, the employees, doctors, chemists don't want to be too evident, Uh, they don't want to have crosses too visible. That depends. Well, it's all related to the susceptibility of society. It's all about negotiating our presence in services that we provide. But in the case of children, we can do that very easily. You must understand that when you belong to a minority, And it's a dynamic, active minority, such as the Christian society in Iraq. Before 2003, it was just 3% of the population. But doctors, engineers, architects, and chemists Uh, In that group, uh, it was 35, 40 percent, the figure. And we have schools, we have hospitals. We provide health services and educational services. And this may generate resentment and envy, but not only do we know how to do politics, but we also know how to cure people and to teach. That is something that we can do. I would just like to um, highlight one phrase of yours. You said that we can help you by being Christian. So we must apply that to those of us who are Christians. Monsignor, I don't know how to thank you for the time that you have shared with us to tell us your story and the journey that you have made to join us. And I wish you the very best for when you go back home, for you and the people who surround you and the people in your diocese and the whole church in your country. Thank you very much.